This video is brought to you by Squarespace. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. In 2012, Animal Planet aired the documentary Mermaids, The Body Found. So I watched it yesterday for the very first time. I would describe it as a, a thoroughly entertaining pile of garbage that should never have been made. And I thought we could go through it together, talk about what it does well, a lot of the stuff that it doesn't do well, and um, the repercussions of its very existence. Here we go. Let's start from the top. We open on an exterior shot filmed with a shaky camera. The camera quickly pans to the right. A man in a suit reaches out towards the lens, shakes the lens as if to make the cameraman stop recording. Then we're greeted by this frame. The scientists in this film are speaking on camera for the very first time. A scientist narrates now a couple interesting things to us. He describes the phenomena known as the bloop. The bloop was a very loud sound that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recorded in 1997. It was an underwater sound recorded underwater. This documentary presents the idea that some scientists think that that sound came from a, a species of, of marine animal that we don't know about. That, that's not true, <laughs> uh, but, but we'll talk about that later. We begin our official story in Washington state at the site of one of these whale strandings. This whole thing is set as a dramatic reenactment. This is the scientist in the dramatic reenactment. His real name is Dr. Paul Robertson. He describes himself as a research assistant for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration. Paul's partner in crime is Dr. Rebecca Davies. She describes herself as a biologist who is also also part of Super Team NOAA and investigating these whale strandings. These are presented as real scientists. They're retelling their experiences that we'll be following for the rest of the documentary. What was specifically interesting about these whale strandings is that they had some auditory equipment that was in the water at the time of the whale strandings and they recorded some unusual sounds. Sounds that they claim share an acoustic signature to that of the famous bloop sound and also belong to species of animals that we haven't uh, discovered yet. I think you know where this is going. Nevertheless, we venture on. We get this dude, Dr. Rodney Webster. He's an acoustic scientist who analyzed the recordings that they took. And according to him, you can slow it down and stretch it out. And apparently... Um, there's evidence of, of a language being spoken amongst the gobbledygook of audio that they recorded. It's here where Dr. Paul introduces the idea of the aquatic ape theory. This is what they're putting all their chips on in this documentary, the aquatic ape theory. Uh, the aquatic ape theory is a theory that uh, there's a period of time where our human ancestors lived in coastal areas and spent a lot of the time in the water. So much so that they kind of evolved traits um, that allowed them to succeed in the water, like like webbed hands and thick layers of fat to keep them insulated and stuff like that. But um, there's a catastrophic event like an earthquake. And after that, the, the lineage is kind of split off, you know? So one um, lineage from early man stayed on land and started evolving more towards uh, land-like environments. The other lineage stayed in the ocean and evolved more traits that allowed them to succeed in the ocean. We continue on the story of Super Team Noah, who have been called to South Africa because there's another whale beaching event. They arrive on scene, but there's something interesting about this beaching event specifically. This is the reenactment that is telling the story that the scientists are telling in an interview. For whatever reason, it's kind of inexplicable, someone kind of caught a great white shark, and they wanted to show these scientists that were there for the, the whale thing. They cut open this shark and were able to find the remains of, guys, an unusual animal species that nobody had discovered before. We're getting juicy, baby. So they lay it out on this really nice table and take a look at what we got. So what do we got, Team Noah? What are we looking at? First thing they notice is that the rib cage is kind of collapsible and flexible which they say is a trait of marine mammals. We also have a fin, an unusual fin, which had bones in it. They're able to reconstruct the skull and say that the part of the brain that was responsible for acoustic processing was larger than in a human. Uh, so now we go to an animation of what these things might have looked like, and uh, they're mermaids, you know? We got mermaids underwater, which is, you know, just fantastic. Here are all the pieces. We got the collapsible rib cage. This is like a pelvis. Oh, that suggests 
suggested that this animal once walked upright. I don't know how they leapt to that conclusion. We got a tail fin with bones in it and um, a hand. Then they make this leap to say that Sure, science has no record of mermaids, but um, like cultures have records of mermaids. Cultures all over the world have depicted mermaids for, for years, right? Team Noah is convinced. Paul's like, my guy, we got the mermaids. All we have to do is pack up our stuff and bring it back to the US where we can publish the real science because nothing can get done in South Africa. But who do you think was shows up? 5050 baby the police show up at their lab and take everything it's crazy we have security camp footage of this look at this clearly a police officer who's stealing all of their stuff and it's so sad so paul and super team noah go back to the united states where they find this kid who has footage on his phone of a time where they went to the beaching the whale beaching events and he shows them this the camera and it turns out that there was a there was a mermaid on the phone the whole time, which was crazy. Super Team Noah wants to get more evidence. So they go back into the ocean where they think they can find mermaids. And this guy's like, you know what? We're gonna do it. I'm hearing mermaids. He said he heard the mermaids live and in person. But guess what, baby? The government's here to shut it down. The Navy came and shut everything and took their orange box. They took the orange box that had everything in it. Now we have a sequence where um, mermaids are swimming with dolphins and credit scene and everybody's happy. That's it guys, that's the documentary. The interesting thing about this documentary is I'm sure you would guess that it's all fake, but it's not quite obvious how fake it actually is. The evidence is not real. These whale strandings are not real. The scientists are not real scientists. Dr. Paul Robinson doesn't exist. Dr. Paul Robertson's real name is David. This dude was a hired actor. Dr. Rebecca Davis, her real name is Helen Johns. And I watched this entire documentary and didn't realize that she was an actress who plays Mrs. Barry on one of my favorite shows, Anne with an E. Rather than finding a scientist with an unusual theory and kind of cherry picking evidence to support that theory, they said, screw that, we don't even need to do this. We can make up our own scientists and have them say whatever we want. And by doing that, they were able to create any sort of story that they wanted and weave in any piece of evidence that worked. And it did a really great job of convincing people that mermaids are real. So much so that the actual National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA had to issue a bunch of statements and add a page to their website explaining that mermaids aren't real. A lot of you don't know, I come from an educational background in ecology and evolutionary biology, but after I graduated from college, I worked for eight years in television and I created shows for National Geographic and Disney, educational shows. The strategies that these producers used to try to trick people and manipulate people into kind of believing that mermaids are real are really kind of just like shockingly impressive. <laughs> they do like an outstanding job of blending things that are true with things that are not true throughout the entire thing. For example, the bloop is a real phenomenon that was recorded in 1997. Scientists don't think it was created by an animal at all. Actually, we, we know there are a bunch of publications that say it was created by ice that was ripping apart. Watching it, it's kind of confusing because you're hearing a lot of things that you've heard before, maybe in the news or in a class or something like that, except it's with a lot of misinformation and they use the true stuff to lead you to the fake conclusion. That's why we don't even really need to spend much time debating the aquatic ape theory uh, because it's not real. <laughs> Everything is presented as a fact. Few things at all throughout the whole documentary are presented as theoretical. And the only disclaimers that are ever on screen during the entire thing are these three frames that appear for about five seconds at the end of the credit sequence. And if you read these, the, even they are super vague. The producers did a really great job. That being said, I would like to offer a few criticisms of some points where the documentary fell flat. So I think the birthing scene where a mermaid gave birth underwater and brought her child up to the surface for its first breath was a little dramatic, as well as the scene where the mermaid sacrificed itself to a megalodon to save its family pot of mermaids 
uh, felt just a little out of place. <laughs> when this documentary aired, it became its most successful show ever on Animal Planet. The ratings or the number of people who tuned in beat the previous record, which was held by Steve Irwin's memorial special. Now, after tricking a bunch of people into believing that mermaids exist, so much so that a government agency had to issue a statement about it, you would think that Animal Planet, you know, would issue a statement to clear things up. Maybe course correct, maybe not necessarily go down this path of pseudoscience. You know, and surprisingly they did. They issued a statement kind of stepping back saying that they shouldn't have aired the documentary. Psych, I'm only kidding. They doubled down, baby. We're not gonna say this was a mistake. Let's run it back. They made another one, Mermaids, The New Evidence. Then they made Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives. Then the producers made Russian Yeti, The Killer Lives. The guy who made this documentary, Charlie Foley. Let's make him the executive vice president of original content for Animal Planet. This is where we live now. This is Animal Planet. Mermaids exist, baby. Is this a bad thing or not? Honestly, part of me is like, am I really one to judge? Animal Planet clearly thought it was a great idea. It brought in a lot of viewers for them and they rewarded the people who made it. But on the other side of things, it kind of really encourages people to believe in conspiracy theories and in a way erodes people's trust in science. And if anything, it just took airtime and budget away from a show that could actually inspire people to care about nature and the environment. The sequel to this documentary, Mermaids The New Evidence, became Animal Planet's highest rated show of all time. When we talk about ratings, we're talking about the number of people who tuned in. Rather other than thinking about it as if it's the best show that they've ever made, I wonder if they could think about it in a different way. What if you thought about it like this? For so long, you cultivated the trust of your audience to believe that you were making factual programming. So when something came out that was as outlandish as a mermaid documentary, because your audience trusted you, maybe they thought it was a real thing. When they eventually watched it, as a lot of people did, they realized it was fake. Your reputation is effectively destroyed. Perhaps Animal Planet so thoroughly tanked its reputation by airing these mermaid documentaries that people like me, who previously trusted the channel to put out factual stuff, ended up abandoning it entirely. Because honestly, that's kind of what I did. It's just a theory. What do you guys think about this stock? Do you think it was a good thing or bad thing that it exists? But check this out. Squarespace gives people a powerful and beautiful online platform from which to create your website. Connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members only content. Manage your members, send email communications and leverage audience insights all on one easy to use platform. On Squarespace, you can create a community, schedule posts, put them behind a paywall and even set up an e e-commerce store. Basically, you can create your personal Patreon. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash oddanimalspecimens to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much for watching. See you later.